certain pleased to be able to speak before you this evening. I'd like to turn your attention to what Paul wrote in Romans the 15th chapter verse 4. For whatever things were written before are written for our learning that we through now the new King James says the patience but it should be just patience through patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now this uh, scripture is worthy of serious contemplation because of the importance it has on a study of all scripture. Now Adam Clark, I know you know who he is. He's a great 19th century scholar. He made this uh, motto uh, of his last work of a commentary on the entire Bible. That's what he always had in mind. The first part of this verse is in reference to the quote in the previous verse, which I didn't read, which is from the 69th Psalm. However, it has a uh, wider scope of application to all of the sacred, sacred scriptures, showing that the Old Testament, no less than the New Testament, bears a precious and relevant message to all people of all ages. Although many of the forms and shadows of the Old Testament have been realized in the New, a proper understanding of these principles set out, set forth in the Old Testament is surely a, a, uh, a worthy study, one that's being promoted by this particular scripture. A study of the Old Testament will enhance our study of the New. The Jews of the time of Christ lived under the old law, yet their learning was absent. In John, the fifth chapter, verse 39, Jesus, in referring to the Jews of his time, said, You shouldn't search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me, but yet they rejected him. In 1 Corinthians, the tenth chapter, the first 11 verses of that chapter, Paul was making the case that they were were written aforetime in those scriptures that uh, could not be ignored since such scriptures were for their learning and hope. There it reads, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that our fathers, see he's uh, making reference to the Old Testament, our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea, all drank the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These are the things that they should have learned from the Old Testament, but they didn't. And he's very explicit when he says, Now these things, those things in the Old Testament, became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted and do not become adulterers as were some of them as it is written the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did and in one day 23,000 fell nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyers. Now, all these things were written aforetime for their learning. No, that's not what it says. it says. Now, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our, our admonition, those living in the New Testament, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Now, there are many other New Testament passages that affirm such to be the case, as well as the hundreds of New Testament quotations from the Old Testament, as here, and throughout the New Testament. Matthew alone quoted the Old Testament 66 times, just Matthew himself. 
and practically all of Hebrews is written with the Old Testament in view. We read of the patience of the Old Testament heroes of faith, and it provides strong encouragement for Christians who must struggle with many of the problems and situations which confront them. It is a mistake, therefore, for Christians to confine their studies to the New Testament alone. There is joy awaiting the careful student of the Old Testament. The Old Testament contains many role models for us today, great men like Noah, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, David, Daniel, and so forth. Also, there were great women of faith, such as Sarah, Ruth, Esther, and so on. A wonderful role model for women of faith today is that of Hannah, who was the mother of Samuel, one of the greatest prophets of Israel. Her story is told in the first two chapters of First Samuel. Now, there was a certain man of Ramathium, Zophim, that should be a combination word, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Joram, the son of Elihu, son of Toa, son of Zuf, Ephraimite, and he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Hannah was one of the two wives of Elkanah. To be barren in Jewish society at the time was looked upon very unfavorably. Jewish wives wanted children, and it was a disgrace to them to be without. Benina was, uh, that's El Elkanah's other wife, of course, she had children. I might just say this as a sidebar, that it is a, a tremendous blessing for women to be able to, to bear children. And they should always be uh, held in high regard for that ability. And if you look at uh, the 31st chapter of, of uh, 31st verse of the first chapter of Romans, You'll see there that in the New King James it says the word unloving. I don't think that's a very good translation. I think the King James has a much better translation without natural affection because the Greek word there is a, a which means a negation, a storge, which is the one of the four loves that in Greek language, but it has to do with family love. So it's talking about their not having the love that a family, that you would have towards a family member, like a child. I've always heard that there's nothing said in the Bible against abortion. But what is that talking about? If abortion is not, is having no family affection, I don't know what is. But uh, anyway, um, first chapter of First Samuel. As I said, Hannah was one of the two wives. She, she's barren, and that was it. Was very normal for the wives, the women of the uh, Old Testament times, to want children. It says in verse uh, 3 through 7, this man went up from his city yearly to worship, that's Elkanah, and sacrificed to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Nina his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. So she had plenty of children. And to Hannah, he would give a double portion because he loved Hannah. He says, although the 
Lord had closed her womb. So we can see here that Elkanah, even though he loved Hannah more, did not neglect uh, Penina at all. He provided for her and her children, which I'm assuming is his children also. From this passage, clearly Elkanah loved Hannah more than uh, Penina. But he never neglected the duty to her or her children. The question may come to mind to why the Lord had prevented Hannah from having children. Although we might, may not know for certain because it's not stated, it is certainly the case, may very well be the case, that it was just not the time for Samuel to appear on the scene. You know, God had all these plans and it's a, a favor on our part to try to plan things for him. He does things in accordance with his own schedule in the way that he can get it done. And we uh, always think that if he doesn't do it our way, then it won't get done. <laughs> but it does. It does get done. Hannah was going to bear Samuel. And she was going to bear Samuel when the Lord determined that she was going to bear Samuel. And he was going to be a prophet for the Lord. In God's good providence... He was going to determine the proper time for Samuel to be born to appear on the scene. Now, let's have enough patience to do things according to God's schedule and not our schedule. As stated in Proverbs, the 13th chapter, verse 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Haven't you ever hoped for something that never came to pass and you were uh, distressed about it? Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. Therefore, one should exercise patience in our expectations of fulfillment of our prayers. Continuing on in uh, 1 Samuel, and her arrival, it's uh, Benina, also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb, that is Hannah's. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. You can see how distressful this was to Hannah. It was Hannah that Elkanah loved more, but she had borne him no children. Some have said that, well, that's may be the reason that she, he took uh, Benina as a wife so he could have children by her. But it's not always the best thing to have two wives in the same household. <laughs> Hard enough to have one. Is that right, Nancy? Anyway, forget it. <laughs> but a lot of times, in fact, I think if you look at most cases of uh, polygamy in the Old Testament, there was always trouble. It's always trouble. Uh, Hannah was going to, uh, as I say, bear uh, Samuel. And the Lord is going to determine that time to, uh, to do it. And although uh, Hannah had borne Elkanah no children, uh, he still loved her more than Benina. But Benina... She'd been blessed in that society. That was a, indeed a blessing. She used the fact that she had children and Hannah didn't to torment Hannah. She proved herself to be uh, an arrogant, um, insolent woman, incapable of showing compassion. It provoked Hannah to tears, and she refused to eat at least while she was at the, the feast in Shiloh. In 1 Samuel 1, Verse 8, Elkanah reminded Hannah of his affection for her. He loved the sorrowing Hannah more than the arrogant and worthless Benina, but although Elkanah had never forgot his duty to her or her children. In verse 8, then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, 
Why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? He insisted that he was much more to her in his affection than ten sons. Yet it was not to Elkanah that Hannah sought help or solace. She went to God for help and for refuge. In verse 9, it says, So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest, and we don't have really have a record of how Eli became the priest, but nevertheless, he was the priest, and he was sitting on, on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord, and that way he could watch everybody going in and out. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child. Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. Hannah was unselfish in her prayer. She did not ask for any harm to Benina or that uh, she be sent away. Her reproach would be alleviated by being blessed with a son of her own. Should God give her a son, she was willing to give the child back to the service of God. She would share her blessing with God and with all others who would be impacted by her son's service. Hannah was a patient, unselfish, and trustworthy woman who proved faithful in her vow. Now, Eli was a high priest at that time, of course, and, and uh, he would sit at the uh, entrance of the inner court. He could see and observe all who came and went. We read further in 1 Samuel, the first chapter, verses 12 through 18, the following. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. <clears throat> so Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. And that might be a lesson too that wine is not necessarily intoxicating. That's the wine in the Old Testament. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. <clears throat> Eli observed her praying. He saw her lips moving, but no sound. That's an uncommon scene for sure. He assumed incorrectly that she must be drunk, only able to mouth the words, but unable to utter a sound. Therefore, working from a false assumption, he rebuked her for her supposed, supposed drunkenness. In explanation, Hannah said that she was merely pouring out her soul to the Lord. Once he understood her circumstances, he told her to go in peace and that the God of Israel grant her petition. With this, Hannah was content not only because of what Eli had said, but also because she had laid on the Lord all that was troubling her. Once it was in the Lord's hands, she was at peace. We read uh, further in 1 Samuel, the, starting with the 19th verse, Then they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord, and returned and came to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. 
So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I've asked from him from the Lord. And Samuel just means ask of God. At the time Samuel was to make his appearance on the world stage, so to speak, uh, at this time he was, of course, born. Elkanah continued to go up yearly to offer his sacrifice to the Lord, but Hannah did not. Reading in verse uh, 21, Now the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. At exactly what time that was in terms of age, I'm not sure. It's not when he was nine months old and able to take solid food. It's much later than that. But uh, when Hannah had weaned Samuel, she fulfilled her promise. Whatever age he was, three years old, four years, I don't know, she did not forget. So in verse 23, we see that Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. Then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bulls, one ephah, ephah of uh, flour, a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. How young, I don't know. Then they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood before you, stood by you here, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition when I ask of him. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he live, he shall be lent to the Lord. And they worship the Lord there. Once her request was fulfilled, she did not forget her vow. Not only that, when, when she had delivered Samuel to Eli, she did not forget Samuel. But she continued to provide for Samuel's needs. After leaving Samuel with Eli, Hannah offered a prayer and a song. It is worthy of careful examination, but we can't do it now. <laughs> it's uh, too long to, to deal with here. But you might read that song. What lessons can we learn from the uh, faith of Hannah? Well, she knew where to take her problem, straight to God in prayer. In First Samuel, first chapter, verse 10, and she was in bitterness and soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. She had come up to the house of the Lord year after year, all the while suffering ridicule from Benina, who had all that Hannah longed for. No matter what Elkanah wanted Hannah to have, he could not provide the son so desperately desired. Paul wrote that now godliness uh, with contentment is great gain. First, uh, gain, First Timothy 6, verse 6. That no one is to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life to which you are also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses, 1 Timothy 6, chapter, verse 12. In 1 John, the 5th chapter, verses 14 15, we read, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that we, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we, we, know, what he, uh, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. She trusted God to provide the very thing 
that she desired. In verse 11 of that uh, first chapter, she, then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservants, but will give your maidservants a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. Although made in deep distress and anguish, she trusted that God would fulfill her request. She knew only he could do it, but of course she didn't re re uh, ignore her responsibility to act. She also believed that God was faithful to do what he said he would do. Verse 18, he, uh, she said, that your maidservant find favor, favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. She was content at that point in time. <clears throat> in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verses 23 and 24, we read, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. And further we read, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself, 2 Timothy, 2nd chapter, verse 13. And in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 23, we read, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now Hannah also did not forget her promises to the Lord for his faithfulness. And no doubt it was a very emotional event for Hannah to leave Samuel with Eli. Did she know exactly what plan God had for Samuel? Maybe, maybe not. Nevertheless, she was obedient and faithful to her vow. Now, in reading in verse 24, now when she had weaned him, she took him up, the three bulls and so forth, and she explained to Eli that this was the one that she had been praying for. So she left uh, Eli, went to uh, Samuel there with Eli. Hannah also gave God praise for the way he had worked. In the second chapter of 1 Samuel, verses 1 and 2, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. This prayer of Hannah might be compared to the prayer of Mary, Mother Jesus, recorded in Luke 1st chapter, verses 46 through 55. Although we may not know fully what God's plans are or how or when he will carry them out or how or when he will answer our prayers, we can still rejoice in the Lord for there is no one holy like the Lord nor is there a rock like our God. And as the writer of Hebrews so aptly put it in Hebrews 13 chapter verses 5 and 6, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? I hope that this uh, lesson on the faith of Hannah has been beneficial to you. If you... Uh, I don't see any visitors here, but if you have a need to respond to the gospel's call, we want to allow an opportunity now for you to do that as we stand and sing.